Globe joining us today. Uh, my name is Peter Vaz, and I am a senior local governance advisor on the democracy and governance practice at Kimonix International. On behalf of Kimonix, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the forum on new challenges and opportunities in multi-sectoral governance. The focus of our forum today and tomorrow will be on multi-sectoral and people-centered governance for service delivery in specific development sectors. Uh, we look at water, we look at environment and natural resources, and we will look at issues related to locally led development related to accountability, rule of law, and governance. Our forum aims to figure out how to address interconnected development challenges in different sectors by moving the needle on governance in order to achieve progress beyond programs in the words of USAID Administrator Samantha Power. I've been working myself on democracy and governance issues for over 20 years now, and I've experienced both challenges and opportunities in multi-sectoral governance in different countries, including South Africa, Indonesia, and Uganda as they went through decentralization. As we know, rapid urbanization and climate change are bringing new challenges, including water scarcity, environmental degradation, health risks, and increasing poverty. At the same time, there are a myriad of opportunities that have opened up in the development space. Uh, we can start with talking about co-design and co-creation of projects, which are becoming more the norm than the exception nowadays, working with governments and working with citizens around the world. We have new techniques, we have new approaches, we have new methodologies. Uh, these include local systems, human and institutional capacity development, political economy analyses. We have social media, new media channels that we can use uh, to address development challenges. The recent COVID-19 pandemic is a perfect example of this, and I do not need to go further on the challenges we've experienced and how we have adapted as a development community uh, and globally to be able to address development challenges. Uh, we're here on a Zoom webinar with people from all over the world. I was in Vietnam for three years managing a project on strengthening provincial capacity, uh, and we had to really pivot and adapt quickly from in-person to fully remote to now, post to, to now hybrid. And I can tell you that all the logistics that went into this event have been taking us days and days to work on, but I'm glad it's working. Uh, so over the next two days, we'll hear from our panelists how governance initiatives are critical in meeting the challenges that I have talked about earlier. Successful governance systems, regardless of sector, demonstrate inclusive, people-centered administration that is transparent and accountable. Good governance is essential for reliable service delivery that is responsive to the needs of citizens. Um, oh, Julia's already put up the agenda. I was gonna request her to do so. She's one step ahead of me. Uh, so the forum will begin with opening remarks from Laura Pavlovich, who's the direct, Deputy Director of the Democracy, Human Rights and Governance Center at USAID. Uh, which is going to be expanded to a bureau, and Laura will tell us all about that. Following Laura's opening remarks, our first panel today will be on locally-led development in the context of governance. USAID has identified localization as one of the priorities of Administrator Samantha Power, and USAID's goal is to award 25% of all USAID funding to local partners by 2025, up from 6%, and place local communities in the lead in 50% of US programs by 2030. And Laura can tell us those targets are still the same. Uh, this panel is a follow-up to a panel we hosted in April featuring civil society organizations from Lebanon, Ukraine, and Vietnam, and will feature representatives from governments in Ukraine and Lebanon who will discuss their experience on what locally-led development means to them followed by a response from USAID and Kimonix Senior Vice President from the Europe and Eurasia region. 
Unfortunately, our government partner from Vietnam was unable to join today, but I'll be moderating the panel as I can talk a little bit about the experiences in Vietnam. We will then have a 15 minute break before our second panel on water governance. Diving deeper into water sanitation and hygiene governance, this panel will seek to understand governance responses to new challenges like urbanization and climate change. Our panelists lead USAID projects in South Africa, Jordan, and Tajikistan. We will begin day two of the forum with a panel on people-centered environmental governance. Our panelists from the Basel Institute on Governance in Switzerland and from USAID projects in Colombia and Indonesia will focus on how we can extend the concepts and precepts of people-centered justice into other sectors. Our final panel will focus on progress beyond programs. What does this mean for accountability and rule of law? The panelists will examine how projects in this sector can, it can achieve the kind of systemic impact that USAID Administrator Samantha Power and the new USAID policy are looking for, followed by a response from USAID. Now, before our opening remarks from Laura, I would like to talk about some housekeeping rules. I think everyone knows about cell phones and muting and those kinds of things. So I won't go into those details. Uh, but in the true spirit of localization and locally led development, we will have simultaneous interpretation in Arabic and Ukrainian for our first panel after Laura has concluded with her opening remarks. Please switch to these channels if you wish to hear the conversation in either of these languages. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have simultaneous interpretation for the other panels. Uh, it is quite a heavy logistical burden, but as we move forward, we'll try and do that uh, as an organization. Our second panel, we'll then have a 15 minute break and then our second panel will begin 15 minutes after the first one ends. Uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions, I would like to request you to post them in the Q&A tab on Zoom rather than in the general chat, which we will reserve for any general comments which do not need responses. It'll help us keep track of the Q&A if you post your questions in the Q&A tab. Now, for those of us who are in the democracy and governance space, Laura needs no introduction. But for those of you who are meeting Laura for the first time, her bio is posted in the chat and we don't need to waste time going through that. You can read it quickly as Laura comes up to the podium and gives us her opening remarks. Over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and thanks to all of you for having me. Um, today's forum on challenges and opportunities for multi-sectoral governance provides a really great opportunity to consider the crucial interrelationships between development and democracy assistance and outcomes. It comes at a time when the evidence is ever clearer that democracy matters for sustainable development outcomes. At the same time, it's becoming increasingly clear that development results are critical to sustainable democracies. So exchanges like the ones that we're all participating in today are really important if we're better to, if we're able to better understand these relationships and to advance assistance programming that can yield development as well as democratic dividends. To get us started today, I wanted to briefly lay out the evolution of USAID's approach to multi-sectoral, we call it cross-sectoral programming, so you may hear me slipping or toggling between those two terms over the course of my remarks. Um, we really have seen an evolution over the past several years, um, but then I wanted to turn to a few of the opportunities that we see within USAID to advance this work and areas where we would love to deepen the conversation with other practitioners in this space. So for those of you in the DRG space, no, USAID had a cross-sectoral approach to democracy programming before we ever had a DRG sector, right? The earliest DRG assessments were actually political economy analyses conducted for colleagues working in other sectors. USAID's focus on cross-sectoral approaches to democracy rights and governance really began in earnest with our 2013 DRG strategy which shifted our strategic approach as an agency from a focus on democratic institutions to a focus on democratic principles and thinking about how we could be working not only within the DRG portfolio, but also more broadly to advance participation, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. 
This recognized the importance of democratic governance to the achievement and sustainability of results in other sectors. And it also, frankly, took on board the fact that our development efforts falter when they fail to take the politics of, 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 in governance systems into account. A new political economy analysis framework was offered to our colleagues in other sectors as a framework to help in thinking through the political and economic interests and incentives and dynamics that shape the sectors and reforms in which they're engaged and enabling a more realistic understanding of the change that's likely and which investments are likely to have a sustainable impact. But as we've all worked to advance cross-sectoral programming around the world, evidence of a strong correlation between democracy and development results has mounted. Research conducted over this period has confirmed that democracy does indeed lead to improved provision of public goods, whether that's access to electricity, to education, to increases in social protection spending, or to policy commitments to combat climate change. Countries that became democracies increased their gross domestic product per capita by 20% more than non-democratic peer nations over the following three decades. And democracy strengthens economic security. Democracies are four times less likely than autocracies to experience long-term economic downturns. At the same time, while results have mounted at the importance of democracy to development outcomes, we also know that the resilience of democratic institutions globally is increasingly under threat, not only from external shocks such as climate or conflict or debt, but also from within through political polarization, ineffectiveness, inequality, or corruption. The complexity of this challenge really demands a much more fulsome response. So as our administrator noticed, uh, noted in her piece in Foreign Policy earlier this year, over the past two decades, as economic inequality rose, polls showed that people both in rich and poor countries alike began to lose faith in democracy and worry that young people would end up worse off than they were giving populists and ethno-nationalists an opening to exploit grievances and gain a political foothold on every continent. She exhorted all of us to consider broadening our approach to democracy programming and thinking through how we might consider all development programming that respects democratic norms as a form of democracy assistance. This is especially the case in contexts where a democratic opening is underway. We know that democratic transitions can be most catalytic, not only to de democratic process, pro progress, but also to development progress. But this, these transitions are fragile, and we know more than ever how entrenched the systems that they seek to shift may be. So we have to be more nimble in engaging with reformist leaders in these spaces and supporting their efforts to demonstrate to citizens that democracy is delivering tangible results. At the same time, our administrator also noted the importance of leading with democracy in our approach to the development challenges that our assistance seeks to address. She said, we showcase the potential benefits of our own democratic system when we provide assistance in a fair, transparent, inclusive, and participatory manner, strengthening local institutions, employing local workers, respecting the environment, and providing benefits equitably in a society. Democratic donor countries and private businesses have to increase their investments in projects that elevate economic and social inclusion and strengthen democratic norms. These are decisions that ultimately yield not only more equitable results, but also stronger development performance. So within USAID, our vision and our vision within DRG going forward is to seek, is to, seek to advance democratic institutions, processes, norms, and values across our development portfolio, both in environments where development outcomes can help in consolidating democratic gains, but also just as crucially in environments where our development assistance can help lay the groundwork for future democratic development. This vision builds on the work that we and so many of you have done over the past several years to ensure the work that we do across our development portfolios integrates an attention to these principles of participation, inclusion, transparency, and accountability. Our experience working on cross-sectoral programming over the last 10 years has really driven home that core to the value proposition around democracy is the extent to which people feel included and heard in public decision making. And those decisions are nowhere more crucial than those related to service delivery, whether that's water or energy or education or water and sanitation. Ensuring that sectoral assistance is provided in a way that reinforces de democratic norms and processes doesn't just advance democratic de development outcomes, 
it advances democratic ones as well. So how are we advancing this work within USAID? I'd like to highlight a few areas where we're really seeking to pilot this approach. First and foremost, as I've mentioned, we're seeking to broaden our approach to advancing democratic openings. As I've mentioned, it's really critical that democratic reformers are able to demonstrate the tangible benefits of their reform agendas and demonstrate a democratic dividend, whether that includes a focus on aggressively tackling economic inequality, strengthening justice and security, improving quality of life, or generating opportunity for marginalized groups. It's also clear that our resources within USAID alone will never be equal to the challenge that these reformers face. So our Democracy Delivers initiative is focused on leveraging USAID's convening power, our private sector and foundation outreach, our multilat our engagement with donor governments and the interagency and multilateral institutions to really help nascent governments and other local stakeholders demonstrate that democracy is delivering benefits and increasing citizen engagement with and support for those democratic norms and systems. In addition, we're making longer term investments in democratic reforms and ensuring that stable, flexible resources are available over time rather than dropping off post-transition when democratic and development gains can really be consolidated. So through our partnerships for democratic development program, we're looking to really deepen partnerships with countries that have demonstrated democratic advances and resilience. PDD focuses on key development challenges that if left unaddressed may undermine partner countries' democratic development. These identified challenges are not expected to be democracy challenges per se. They can focus on issues like youth unemployment or access to education, electricity or water, or corruption or debt distress. But what's key about PDD is not what we are doing, it's how these issues are addressed. And so I'm really excited that we're having a panel just after this on localization engaging governments because I think this is really critical, right? We need to be working to ensure that the solution to the problem goes beyond a technical fix and really addresses the needs and concerns of citizens, communities, and other actors who have a stake in the solution. Our theory of change is that by expanding participation and broadening inclusion in these reforms, this program will not only help government partners demonstrate that democracy delivers benefits, but also they are delivering these benefits through enhancing citizens' voice resulting in delivering the policies, goods, and services that citizens need. Through PDD, USAID is going to work to bolster locally driven participatory initiatives across other sectors where those tangible improvements can help show the benefits of democracy. So for example, in Malawi, PDD will work on improving service delivery at the local level by working with local authorities, parliaments, civil society to collaborate on improving local public service delivery. The Governance for Solutions activity is part of a much broader interagency and donor engagement effort to build the government of Malawi's and the private sector service delivery capacities across multiple sectors. In addition to our efforts to expand our approaches to extending democratic openings, I also wanted to highlight two additional potentially transformational opportunities that we see to advance uh, multi-sectoral approaches in ways that advance both democratic development and democratic outcomes that you all will be talking about more um, over the course of this forum. As I've mentioned, this new focus on expanding our approaches to democracy assistance is rooted in an understanding of the complex challenges that democracy faces, right? That includes both the, the, the external challenges of climate change and environmental degradation, but also the internal challenge of corruption. At the same time, I think as DRG people, we need to take on board the fact that both climate change and corruption are huge mobilizers of public participation that really cut through the apathy that plagues so many countries where we operate, especially with youth and social movements. Engagement with these activists can help in creating a positive agenda that can galvanize the broader and inclusive public participation that's so critical to democratic resilience. So DRG programs working in this way can play an important role engaging across sectors to foster support of legal and policymaking environment and help in identifying the feasible pathways forward for this activism through governance systems. And this way, not only addressing climate and corruption challenges, but also deepening democratic engagement. This work is really going to be essential to strengthening the systems that are needed for effective advocacy and transparent and accountable policy making to address the challenges these activists are raising up to all of us. 
So as we look at some of our more recent strategies focused on climate and anti-corruption, they both incorporate a focus on cross-sectoral approaches for this reason. In the case of the climate strategy, inclusive governance and citizen engagement are recognized as essential to transformational climate action. Within the DRG Center, we're developing resources and deploying technical assistance to field missions to support our global cadre in identifying climate linkages with DRG portfolios and advancing work streams that advance both democracy and climate outcomes. To support implementation of the climate strategy, we've developed an implementation plan to advance DRG sector goals through and for climate action. We're, in we're encouraging our colleagues across the agency working on these issues to share their research and their learning as we move from the concept of environmental governance across sectors to really putting it into practice. And we're really looking forward to this discussion and also frankly to engaging all of you in those efforts going forward. In the anti-corruption space, as you all are very well aware, we've amassed significant experience in cross-sectoral work. At the country level, we have deep experience in programs working at the nexus of anti-corruption and governance, health, economic growth, and natural resource management. But the US strategy to counter corruption across, really puts countering corruption across sectors at the center of our US government approach and has provided an invaluable platform to scale up cross sectoral approaches across the agency and across the US government. And our new anti corruption policy, which was released last December, is aimed at transforming the way that we work on corruption as an agency, including that we to ensure that we are finding ways to address this scourge in a multi sectoral way. As my colleague Jen Lewis mentioned at the Commonics Forum on new approaches to countering corruption across sectors last fall, our policy recognizes that we need to address the inherently transsectoral nature of corruption, including in the ways that it manifests across the health, education, climate, and economic growth sectors, and the fundamental ways in which it impedes progress against development objectives in all of these spaces. Here too, our anti-corruption colleagues had developed practitioner-oriented guidance for USAID staff, implementers, and the broader anti-corruption community about ways to identify opportunities to address corruption across sectors and bring anti-corruption approaches into sectoral programming. This cross-sectoral programming is not only critical to start safeguarding our technical investments in the sustainability of our sectoral work, it's critical to enhancing the enabling environment for oversight, transparency, and accountability that are absolutely central to democratic resilience. So where do we go from here? These are these areas that I've been talking about with respect to support to democratic reformers, with respect to multi-sectoral approaches to climate and anti-corruption, are a few areas where we're really hoping to advance a much more mutually reinforcing approach to cross-sectoral approach uh, to, to cross-sectoral work in the months and years ahead. Within USAID, as Peter's mentioned, we have a couple of additional opportunities to advance these approaches that are coming up. Within the soon-to-be DRG Bureau and in our forthcoming DRG policy, we will be looking to advance our efforts to ensure that all of our democracy or all of our development programming consider how it can promote accountable states, active citizens, and democratic resilience, and that these goals be considered alongside other sectoral priorities and strategy and policy making, both in our field missions, but also really critically here in Washington. But to do that effectively, we need to continue to build the evidence base, not only with respect to the correlation between democracy and development outcomes, but also the converse the forms of development assistance that can be most catalytic to democratic development in all contexts in which we operate. The programs that you all are implementing and the lessons that you are learning are going to be really critical to those efforts. We also need to develop the resources and capacities across our development portfolio and across our global workforce to enable all of us to respond more nimbly to these opportunities to advance democratic resilience and to better position us as an agency to respond to these opportunities in both opening and in closing spaces. And here too, your efforts and your learning are going to be really crucial to those efforts. Opportunities like today's forum are an amazing, uh, amazing chance for us to share those lessons and these resources. And I'm really looking forward to the panels that follow. Thanks again for having me. Great, thank you, Laura, for those words of wisdom and those insights into USAID's thinking on, on 
cross-sectoral, multi-sectoral governance, integration, and so on and so forth. I'm going to ask Julia to hop on quickly. You've been hearing a random bing as we've gone, as we've been going through this. She's going to fix that random bing. Julia has been a wonderful resource to her. She's on rotation with us as a senior associate in our democracy and governance practice. And in the three months that she's been here, she's been just working wonders, uh, not just administratively, but technically as well. Uh, so uh, we are now going to move into our first panel, which is our localization panel. Um, and I'm going to request Tatiana Dudka, who is, who sh who's also known as Tanya, uh, to make opening remarks. Uh, Tanya is our Senior Vice President for our Europe and Eurasia Bureau. And if you need more information on her, it will be posted, her bio will be posted in the chat. Over to you, Tanya. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you so much, Laura, for sharing USAID's vision and new approaches, but also continuation, right, of the work that we all have been doing for many decades on engaging local leaders and uh, USA's programming and implementation. Um, locally led development is at the heart of Chemonix operations. And I think the whole development community would agree that you cannot have development without putting local voices, local needs, local actors uh, at the front and you know, core designing, core implementing, core monitoring and core learning with them. So it is in the heart of Kimonix operations in our processes and how we work with our people in our partnerships, carefully designed to enhance local ownership and, and lasting impact. Our priority is to enable our partners, government reformers in countries we work and our staff to be responsive to the citizens' needs. Engaging them early from the process of design, of activities, of programs, um, of any opportunities, co-creation through implementation. And this is um, this has been proven to be the most effective sustainability methodology and key to success. And it's really encouraging to see you safe continuing to reform this way. Uh, and Chemonix will work hand in hand with USAID and all our partners on this. I participated in the last couple of days in USAID's co-creation workshop on, on new partnerships and localization. And it was really inspiring to work together with the whole development community, with local organizations, with international organizations and USAID counterparts on finding new ways uh, to advance localization and to bring uh, voices of our local partners and global partners and domestic partners to the table. Chemonix has a global workforce of 6,000 professionals and we are in 98 countries right now. So I think as a company, we have this great opportunity to, to amplify uh, our global, global voices and global needs and participate in locally led development. Uh, this connection is also sustainable because as programs are concluding, uh, our strong network of alumni continue to advance their countries by participating in public and private sector roles, uh, advancing their country's development goals. And our deep understanding and connections with people and communities and creation of networks of networks really helps us as an implementer to address changing needs and achieve um, development impact in the time of greatest need. Um, for example, with the full scale Russia's invasion in Ukraine last year, our local networks and partnerships with civil society business, local and national governments enabled us to get real time contextual information on, on needs and opportunities and to provide that support quickly and where needed. Uh, the USA's Democratic Governance East project in Ukraine equipped 220 new workspaces to enable government service delivery and near 500,000 Ukrainians, including those temporarily displaced uh, from occupied territories, received access to government services in the last year. The project equipped 138 bomb shelters, established 78 humanitarian support facilities, provided generators, heaters, water pumps, cell phones, and many more to schools, hospitals, IDP centers, and other stakeholders. All these needs were identified by our local partners, and we fulfilled them together. Um, 
it's critical to know priorities uh, of our local partners. They all have knowledge and experience and they have the vision for the joint future. And it's really critical for development to address current needs and gaps and address it timely and address them in the way that empowers local actors to continue and to do more on their own. Um, and not only build sustainability, but build endurance to um, be able to withstand to future shocks and future crises and future changes that the countries experience. Um, we are also emphasizing a people-centered approach through our programs, starting from the rule of law programs in Colombia and Kosovo and Ukraine, uh, to governance on the Ukraine DG East, to anti-corruption on uh, Peru TPI. And the priority for our programming is to make an impact on people's everyday lives. And locally led development and putting local needs and actors in the center is the only way to achieve it. There are numerous examples on how development programs can put local actors at the center of their work. For example, in Vietnam, where Peter was the chief of party for the strengthening provincial capacity activity, uh, he worked to strengthen work of the School of Government at the University of Economics of Ho Chi Minh City and the Startup Vietnam Foundation. And they co-designed and co-implemented activities focused on innovation and digital transformation, leadership and economic governance, gender equality and social inclusion, MEL, to ensure buy-in and sustainability. This improved the quality and sustainability of economic governance in the city and in the country and enabled uh, partnerships between provincial officers and private sector to create robust environment for uh, economic growth and continued economic improvements. Supporting reformers and responsive governance instills the confidence in people that the leaders work in the interest of people and that democracy delivers as pointed out by administrator power. And a true example of that are our two panelists that are joining us today. Natalia Makohon is the deputy head of Krimina City Military Administration. Krimina is a city in Eastern Ukraine in Luhansk Oblast that is occupied by Russia. Since the first invasion in 2014, Natalia has been overseeing all organizational matters of the Kremlin territorial community. And with the large scale invasion last year, Natalia works to ensure delivery of humanitarian aid, medications, food, uninterrupted government services, support to relocated organizations, creation of humanitarian hubs around Ukraine, while leading her team uh, temporarily from the Western Ukraine where they relocated. Ibrahim Masher is the mayor of Bikosta municipality in Lebanon. He was elected in 2016 and since then he diligently serves the citizens of Bikosta spearheading a number of critical reforms and projects, including improving water supply and structural building reinforcements with the USAID's community support program. He led his team collaboratively to um, serve citizens and I really look forward to learning from uh, Mr. Masher's and Ms. Bahagon's experiences. They have different priorities, they lead different teams, but they both have the same goal uh, in front and center for the activities. It's the prosperity and better future for the citizens of communities they serve. Peter, back to you to moderate the conversation. Thank you so much, Tani. I think this is a great introduction and great welcoming remarks to start off our panel. Um, I'm going to sit, because I prefer to sit and be able to talk to people, but I guess I'm trying to figure out. Okay, can everybody see me? Okay, I know the people in the room can. <laughs> okay, so, um, the first question for our panelists, uh, Mayor Mesa and Ms. Mahogan, uh, and we'll start with the mayor, uh, is to ask you both to share with us a little bit more about the institution you are representing today and what motivated you personally to be part of local governance in your community. Over to you, Mayor. <laughs> First, I would like 
to thank you for أنا choosing me today to be with you. بسطة. سلامة مهامي بعد انتخابي سنة 2016 I have received my mandate in Pusta after 2016's election. I was the youngest mayor. And this was a great challenge for me and for the young persons in my village and community. My goal was to change. I have learned from my errors and I succeeded with the municipality members. عم بحكي عن قصة شاب بعمر 25 سنة سلم رئيسة رئاسة بلدية وهو معكم اليوم تجاوب على جميع السلطة and now I'm here today with you in order to reply to all your queries and questions thank you sorry we're going through some logistical things in terms of we had we had Natalia on on camera instead of the mayor. We'll sort out those logistical issues. Uh, now, Natalia, uh, if you could answer the same question that I just asked the mayor, we'd appreciate it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I also thank you for having me, and uh, I would like to thank for the support and help to the Ukrainian people for uh, in our fight against the Russian aggressor. Our joint victory will guarantee uh, peace not only in our region, not only in Europe, but across the globe. And I am representing a community from the eastern Ukraine. It's the Kriminna city, uh, Lugansk. Uh, uh, province and my uh, city was called uh, was called uh, uh, Pearl of uh, Donbass. Uh, we had a national park, um, we had great um, cities, uh, great trees, uh, 400 years old trees, it's, uh, with a unique um, uh, natural system, lakes, uh, this was a center of Olympic and Paralympic uh, training center for the entire Donbass region, but uh, over the last year the city is under the occupation. And since the start of the full-scale invasion, Russian full-scale invasion into Ukraine, we, as a city council, uh, we were transformed in the military administration with the re relevant powers. And I've been working in the local governance uh, for over 20 years. The reason why I chose this uh, path is that I could, I could leave, I could uh, quit. Uh, and I, but I, I didn't put this question to me. Because during the short period when our city was encircled by the Russian aggressors and I looked people into the eye and I saw they believe in me, they expect me to help them. And during this war, for us as Ukrainians, it became a challenge. It became a Test. Everyone had to make up their own mind and realize that uh, nobody else would do that for us. Um, war makes impossible things possible. And for the first time of the independent Ukraine, um, me and other people saw that uh, people built trust in the government. Um, the reason why I'm in the local governance, probably I'm not a person who is talking about the future, but I'm a person who is creating this future, and I'm thankful to be here and um, be, am able to say these words. Great, thank you very much, Natalia. Um, you know, given what you've talked to us about the invasion, your job today looks a lot different from what you've been doing, uh, you know, starting from February 24th, 2022. Uh, can you please share with us and with our audience more about the transition from doing the local, usual local governance work? So what kind of work you were doing prior to the war uh, and the 
response that you now have to major crises and full-blown invasion? So, before the war, uh, it was a peaceful city, developing city, um, city interested in European integration, and as I said, we had modern uh, sports infrastructure, we had uh, service uh, centers for the citizens, um, we developed recreational infrastructure and entertainment infrastructure, but after the 24th of February, everything was changed. We had to switch to functions which were not natural um, for local governments. Um, first of all, we were evacuating people, especially elderly people. We managed to evacuate low mobility uh, people who cannot move at all. We found the proper uh, vehicles and were able to get them out. What the war showed is that um, our people, our residents, uh, and our volunteers are helping the government. Most of the work uh, was done together with the volunteers who got together and stood behind the local government. And I urged people and I asked them through social media that they need to leave, they don't need to stick to their belongings because life is the most valuable thing and we need to uh, preserve it. We were delivering medications, foods, there were critical issues um, when uh, some diapers and hygiene products for children because when people are leaving, shops are closed, there are no uh, supply lines, um, it was really difficult. We were even cooking food and baking bread to uh, supply people who stayed and make sure they have food, at least some food. We were repairing power lines under shelling and water supply lines to make sure that people have water and power, at least some basic needs are met. When we managed to evacuate the stables uh, from, we had stables where uh, horses um, had, uh, were providing uh, therapy to children with uh, serious uh, diseases, and we managed to evacuate them. But unfortunately, um, we, our force, armed forces had to give up this city, and most of our team has left. We decided to evacuate to the Ukraine-controlled territory. It was on the 12th of um, April 2022, and uh, on the 17th of April, the city was occupied. So what we faced is that we were in the situation where uh, it was really difficult to work as we got used to work as a local government. First of all, we didn't have physical access to our community. But we transformed and decided that the key is not the bricks and walls, the key is people. Because what is, what is community? It's, uh, it's members. And they were spread across Ukraine at that time. And we had to provide... Uh, and we had to make sure that our uh, municipal companies, our kindergartens, uh, we had lots of people on benefits, uh, and we got together and started working. And today, we have all our schools open, uh, providing 
um, o educational services online. Нашим школам, uh, when it comes to our uh, schools uh, from our community, we managed to evacuate and uh, organize online uh, learning for 54% of the people from our community. 22% are now abroad and studying from there. At least, uh, unfortunately, 24% are in the occupied areas still. Last year, uh, our children on time got all the education and graduation certificates, and this year they will be finishing their uh, education and will get the documents. And children are graduating with honors. У нас організували, ми починали, зробили повністю реєстр всіх мешканців нашої громади, які перемістили для того, знати, де вони є, щоб знати потреби в нас створено на зараз діє п'ять координаційних центрів, які застосовані п'яти обласних центрів of Ukraine. We are taking care of um, over 9,000 people. We are providing them with humanitarian aid, but also not only food, uh, packs, uh, hygiene, linen, because people were living with just one bag where they had just the basic things for two, three months. And in these centers, we are also now providing psychological and legal uh, support. We are taking care of employment and social issues for these people. We are providing consultations how to set up uh, their business, how to restore their business. We are providing a range of administrative services at the, in these coordination centers, we opened up um, platforms for children to be able to, to communicate because people don't have to feel the work. They should feel protected. And we have hold master classes for them. We organized our own theater involving IDPs uh, and this theater. Uh, gives performances across Ukraine. We set up a system to provide social services, especially to vulnerable people of our community, like children and, first of all, that, uh, health care, also servicemen and uh, their families, um, low-income people, families that need urgent uh, medical Support. We are providing a number of um, financial benefits to them to make sure that we improve our communications and improve management of the community members. We are trying to introduce transparent processes. We have a call center hotline. We have a website of our community in reporting on all the events and collecting feedback. We are creating a chatbot for our community members to be able to reach out to us and to submit questions, uh, concerns. Apart from that, what we are dealing with is bringing the community together, supporting the 
громадські організації, які виїхали з нашої громади, громадські об'єднання, волонтерські спільноти, які виїхали з нашої громади. Ми їх зобрали і зараз ми займаємося підтримкою допомоги мешканцям нашої громади. Але ми не стимо надалі, ми знаємо, що буде окупація, об'єднання наших територій, це обов'язково, це не піддається ніякому сумніву. We have no doubts about that. That's why we developed a roadmap what to do after the liberation within the first 30 days. What we need to, what steps, first steps that we need to take to address the basic needs of people who are there. We developed an investment plan for our community. Найбільші плюси, що у нас є в нашій громаді, чим ми можемо бути цікаві для інвесторів, і що нашу територію треба розвивати. Ми залучаємо до цієї роботи не тільки мешканців нашої громади, виконуємо не тільки мешканців нашої громади, так і напрямок роботи молоді. Ми створюємо молодіжну раду, яка в нас працює, і ми залучаємо її до цієї роботи, до розвитку нашої території in the development of our community and we are going to continue this effort because our opinion is that recovery means bringing people back to the occupied areas, to the liberated areas, bringing back the businesses. If we don't, it will be our biggest failure, our biggest defeat in front of the Russian Federation. Our areas will just die out. That's why we will not let that happen. We are fighting for each community member. We are знала, що її ніхто не покинув, що ми повернемося на деокуповану територію і будемо відновлювати нашу громаду. Дякую вам дуже, Наталія. Це дійсно приклад, як ми бачимо, що потрібно в одній області в часі кризису і кризису, і що робити ви робите як одній області together with the citizens to participate in people-centered governance. Um, I want to ask you a further question uh, about elaborating on your collaboration with USAID through DG East and the collective ability to respond to the ever-changing needs in the time of conflict. Sorry, did you hear my question? Перш ніж сказати, ніж сказати, як нас підтримав підтримав проект ЮСЕЙ, це вже у умовах військового стану. Я все таки хочу зупинитися, що це партнери ЮСЕЙ, Кімоні, це наші давні партнери нашої громади. Ми в території нашої громади не один проект за допомогою цих партнерів. Я тільки хочу наголосити, що в 2001 році у нас було впроваджено проєкт відновлення і відновлення і провадження адміністративних послуг, а саме реєстрація, перереєстрація транспорту. Перед цим наш центр надання адміністративних і соціальних послуг, завдяки був підтриманий програмі USAID і МОНІКС, де надавалося більше 244 послуг всіх адміністративних і соціальних послуг, куди людина могла пройти в одне місце і отримати всі потрібні послуги. Наша мрія вже майже була здійснилася в 2021 році. Це створення інноваційної платформи і залучення громадської зеленої бібліографії на території. Це була мрія нашої молоді створити такий хаб. Це було заплатно на все обладнання. Ми провели ремонт території, і вже планувалося відкриття п'яти. Ми планували десь приблизно на 15 вересня 2021 року. 
15th of March 2022, but uh, the worm came. And last year, in, and, and in 2021, we were also talking about the energy resilience of our community. We signed a memorandum that to uh, develop uh, energy resilience and um, uh, self self reliance of our community. But again, it didn't happen because of the war. In 2022, we were forced to leave our community and the first to respond to us were USAID uh, Chemonix program. On the 10th of May, and we left uh, on, in April. So on the 10th of May, we signed a memorandum about technical assistance. Because we were living with uh, just one bag, some personal belongings, laptops. We didn't have um, equipment and um, furniture to start working. And the project provided us with uh, the computer equipment, with furniture, and all we needed to start working working as an administration, uh, and we are grateful for that. Also, we are grateful USAID for the support uh, of uh, the USA program. They provided a number of uh, trainings uh, for us to re-skill and re-qualify to understand how to prioritize our services. We look at ways how to improve our organizational, organizational efficiency, how to address and mitigate our risks. We looked uh, and conducted uh, institutional assessment of our activities, and as a result, we developed guidance uh, how to continue to to operate as a military administration under the martial law. And we are using now this guidance in our work, and this is the results, the achievements um, of our uh, military uh, administration. They are underpinned by the, the guidance. Apart from that, um, the program helped us to create unbreakability uh, hubs uh, for our citizens. Um, we procured generators, um, lamps, um, kettles, uh, heaters, and this equipment was used uh, by our coordination centers during the winter period when we didn't have power during blackouts, when our residents across Ukraine there were power outages and no communication, and in these communication centers people could get their phone charged, uh, phone to their relatives, uh, and it was places uh, for people to get together, uh, for, for IDPs, for residents of uh, neighboring communities. All these people could come to our coordination centers, have a warm drink, and feel our support. That's why we are very grateful for USAID's uh, uh, support. You are a cool team. It's a pleasure to work with you because you promptly respond to all the challenges of, the, of our communities. Much. Again, again, I see this is a, a real case of locally led development where your needs are being put at the front of the work that USAID is doing to support you. Um, I'll now turn to Mayor Medza and ask you to reflect on the work with USAID through Lebanon CSP project and even more broadly with the international donors that supported your municipality. Um, in, in, in the spirit of localization and locally led development. No. 
بلش التعاون بين البلدية Have you finished or do you need to continue? لا لا وقفت أنا وقفت. No, uh, he has stopped. He has stopped. Okay, great. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think it'll be useful to explain to us how the donor support that we provided, both, both USAID and other donors, boosted the capacity of your institution to respond to the competing needs of people in your municipality. Yes, yes. No. Uh, yes. In order to reply, the needs, the needs we've been uh, supporting, I need to highlight something. Lebanon is facing in the hard economic situation hundreds of years. Because poverty line has become the uh, الدولة ما في السي، البلدية ما في السي، والوزارات ما في السي. اليوم اللي قامت بي، قامت في اليوسعيد في بقصة بالأخص، قاطت أمل السكان. لأنه الدعم اللي قدمته عبر تقديم هذا الخزان هو خلى 17 ألف ساكن يستفيدوا منه وبالأخص أنه يوفروا مبلغ كبير من المال اللي كانوا عم يشتروا فيه شهريا لحتى يشتروا مي رغم كل الصعوبات اللي عم يمرق فيها لبنان بعض الدعم من منظمات المؤسسات الدولية عم تساعد المواطنين one of the crucial questions in working on democracy and governance programs is how to sustain the impact uh, or as referred to by Administrator Samantha Power, achieve progress beyond programs. Whether it's a tangible improvement like building a well or procuring a water container or building a park or less practical uh, uh, in terms of uh, somebody, uh, sorry, as somebody who practices local governance and service delivery every day, what advice would you give for donors and international development practitioners regarding practices that would support your vision and ability to be responsive to your citizens in a sustainable way? Effectively, the role which was done by Kamenek and USAID in Bukhsa village was 
كانت المتابعة شبه يومية عبر الهاتف والأهم من كل هيدا أنه كان في تاون هول ميتنج حتى بعد تنفيذ المشروع اللي تنفذ اللي هو الخزان كنا عم نتعلم الناس كيفية الترشيد بالماء والاستفادة من الماء هيدا كان من أهم التاون هول ميتنج كان من أهم المتابعة اللي كانت عم تتابعها من بيو أسايد الكامونكس أما عن صعيد اللي نحن ممكن نساعد عليه مستقبلا نحن وياكم والله من بعد الازمه الاقتصاديه اللي صارت بلبنان اللي هي من اكبر الازمات اليوم البلديه ان كان بوسطا ولا معظم بلديات لبنان عم بتعاني من موضوع عدم مسافه النفايات عن الطرقات للاسف الدوله كانت هي تدفع عن البلديات إزالة النفايات اليوم صار إزالة النفايات على حساب البلديات تدهور سعر الصرف بالبلاد وصلتنا أنه نحن نشوف نفايات على الأرض فكنا بعدة أمرار كنت أنا كل شخصيا عم بدفع حتى زيد عن النفايات كان في دعم من السكان اللي كانوا قادرين أو كان عم يساعدوا بعتقد هذه الأزمة بعدها عم بتطول ورحين للأصعب من هيك الموضوع عن النفايات إذا, إذا كان ممكن من أحد المنظمات تساعدنا عبر المعمل الفرزي اللي قدمه في اليو كي اي دي نكون عم نطوره لأنه مع التاكي فيه إنه ما بيحمل منطقة اليوم بقصة النفايات الموجودة فيها عم تنشاري بالنهار واحد إلى 15 طن فالمعمل ما بيستوعب المعدات الموجودين فيه ما بيستوعبوا كذلك الأمر نحن بحاجة إذا بدت الأزمة ما كان حدا عم يساعدنا مضطرين نكون عم نعمش لسيارة نقل نفايات كمان حتى نقدر نعالجه. بعتقد هذا اهم الامور اليوم حاليا اللي نحن بحاجه لها كبلد شكرا. ثانك يو. جريت ثانك يو فيري ماتش ميمت. ا كويستشن باك تو يو ناتاليا. انذر كويستشن ذات وي هاف فور يو از وات ار سم اوف ذا ريكومنديشنز ذات يو هاف فور هاو يو اس اي دي كان بيتر سبورت يوكراين ديورينغ ذا كرايسيس. and better involve Ukrainians in locally-led development. Yes, um, USA Kimonix uh, support is really important and essential for the Ukrainian people, for our community. And I should mention that when we had training to implement transparency in our government, і в нас було це зроблено на прикладі нашого центру надання соціальних послуг. І коли до нас зайшли окупанти, і вони зайшли в цей центр, це все побачили, і вони, знаєте, сказали одну таку фразу. Ці пляті американці зруйнували всю систему, що вони наробили. Що в нас було все прозоро, що люди могли прийти і в одне місто все отримати, не отримати всі послуги, отримати всі всю документу. Не треба було нікуди в іншому місці звертатися. Before the occupation, it was a place where everyone from our community could get all the services they need. Now, it will, this um, service center um, will not be working because uh, when we liberate uh, the uh, area, um, the, all the equipment, all the facilities that we had there, they will be looted and dropped by the aggressors. Um, we will need to provide uh, and procure all this equipment. We will need to create standalone power supply system. житла, модульного житла, це стосується транспорту, тому що його там ніякого транспорту немає. Це стосується поводження з відходами, особливо з відходами після зруйнувань, відходами будівельними, відходами після зруйнованих будівель домівок. 
І ви знаєте, наша громада, як і вся Україна, зараз готова запропонувати таку пропозицію, що ми готові стати таким експериментальним майданчиком, щоб показати всьому світу, як в таких умовах громада може швидко відновлюватися і відстроюватися. Ми готові до прийняття нестандартних рішень. Ну, наприклад, одне з таких запропонованих рішень можливо буде використання в наших громадах в Україні, да, де окупованих, наприклад, транспорту, який вже використовується або буде там іти на заміну, наприклад, в тих Сполучених Штатах Америки або в інших європейських країнах, щоб його використовувати і ці лінії, технології, ці машини використовувати вже на території нашої окупованої громади. Тому що дійсно нам треба буде відновлювати все, всі системи водопостачання, електропостачання, просто відновлення житла. Up to housing for people. Thank you very much, Natalia. We really appreciate this. I think, you know, USA is here and is listening to what the needs of the people of Ukraine and what the people of Lebanon are. Um, I'm now going to turn to David Jacobs' team, uh, who is with the USAID uh, DRG Center, to give us some reflections. And maybe the first question I can pose in terms of reflections to you, uh, David, is what have you heard that echoes with the current strategy that Administrator Power refers to as progress beyond programs? Thank you, Peter, and uh, a particular um, thank you to uh, to both of our panelists uh, for really um, excellent illustrations of uh, kind of how you are leading uh, in your own responsive ways for development and, and you know, how USAID and our partners can um, be more effective in supporting you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the first thing I would say is that, um, uh, you know, the emphasis at USAID on uh, locally led development uh, and on thinking about progress beyond programs and all the other kind of, um, you know, it quickly becomes jargon, the phrases that we use, but the meaning behind those phrases is really meant to signal that we increasingly are realizing that we need to change how we understand what our work is. Um, uh, to something that is really um, identifying, working with, supporting local change makers. Um, you know, we need to uh, not only listen to them, but earn their trust as a as a funder, as a supporter. Um, and then, you know, when we think of how we are responsive, how we are adaptive, how we are selecting investments so that they will be, you know, the, the older term might be sustainability. I think that's what's meant by progress beyond programs. Um, the idea that, that what we work on in a given USAID project should um, support um, you know, outcomes that last beyond that short-term period uh, requires a slightly different way of thinking um, where particularly in the, the democracy rights and governance space, we're looking at enabling uh, you know, actors, local governments, uh, you know, civil society, uh, national governments, whoever it might be, to be responsive to what they're hearing over time. Um, and rather than deciding what needs to be in place, what what institution, what what thing needs to be fixed, that if we are going to care, as Laura said in her opening, much more about underlying norms and values and how our systems and processes contribute to that, that following through on that means taking more guidance from uh you know actors like our panelists and saying they are hearing that this is what they should be doing this is what they would like you know can you offer this training can you help develop or you know establish this this thing um, and kind of um shaping our support around what they're identifying and that that is a different conception of partnership or perhaps not different but deeper than it has historically been and is to me kind of where the exciting energy is to translate some of these uh, high level visions into the nuts and bolts of day to day work. Uh, another question I have for you, 
uh, is where does localization show up in the USA draft DRG policy that USAID is currently working on? I mean, we're just trying to get some nuggets in advance. Absolutely. <laughs> And, and please uh, so, feel free to say you can't respond. No, no, absolutely I can. I, I, I will note that it is in draft. And so uh, what I'm saying are things that are subject to change. Um, but kind of broadly speaking, I think there's been an emphasis that, um, that as I said, that the localization is meant to be how USAID transforms itself so that it can more effectively support and foster locally led development. And so I think, uh, as with many things in bureaucracies, the attention often moves quickly to different metrics. We have one around direct funding. We have one around local voice. Um, I think they're good metrics and we want to see progress. But particularly in the DRG sector, um, you know, the, the, the whole idea of, of you know, uh, functional democracy, of support for human rights, of effective governance, are things that we have never been able to deliver ourselves, right? We can't come in and offer people justice or uh, equity or inclusion or any of those things. So we have always been working through, uh, you know, mayors and town councils or civil society organizations or human rights activists or whoever it might be. Um, but I think we need to be doing a better job shifting the, the power and the paradigm of that from us envisioning to them envisioning and us supporting and, and recognizing that they will lead the way through a multi-year journey uh, and we will get to support it at times for different parts of that, um, you know, and, and there are deep implications for us. And so in the policy where that shows up, uh, there are some connections to the ideas of understanding power dynamics and incentives and political economy so that uh, we are working with actors who can navigate those realities to make change. Um, you know, deepening what we mean by being flexible and adaptive to go beyond simply we can adjust when we see things aren't working to saying actually we need to build support such that it expects to adjust regularly um, to what other people are saying. Um, and uh, I think you also see a connection to some very um, deep-seated ideas um, there's some language the, the principle on it is kind of connected to some of our um, our shifts that the policy outlines around learning. Um, and this is particularly moving us from the question of what works as an international development agency to the question of um, why do certain things work in certain places and what does that mean can usefully be transferred somewhere else. So really understanding uh, you know, outcomes and effectiveness of anything we're contributing to our, our you know, interventions, if you will, um, as something that isn't a testable question of does this intervention work, yes or no, but more uh, when we do this thing and it enters a particular context, why were local change makers able to leverage that and make progress or not? And so if I am looking to learn from the experience in Lebanon and say, well, I'm going to be posted to, uh, I don't know, Peru, and I want to see, um, you know, the way they were supporting uh, you know, the the needs assessments and the activities based on, uh, you know, a collective vision and, and through the mayor, um, what would I need to copy and what shouldn't I copy because of the ways in which, you know, some province in Peru is different than Lebanon. Um, and I think that's something that the policy highlights. So we're, we're looking at, um, I think, the, the connection to learning and then drawing a, a stronger um, emphasis that locally led development needs to be part of a technical approach of what effective uh, DRG work is, um, you know, that given the high level attention to these issues of um, kind of uh, underlying, you know, norms, values, systems, and structures, that, uh, you know, and uh, a big focus for the overall policy is on democratic resilience and renewal. And so again, that there's not an endpoint, there's not a destination where you say we have the things in place, this is, you know, perfect democracy, now all is done. But to kind of say, well, what needs to be in the society? Um, how are we contributing to that? How is that going to be a society that innovates, that solves its own problems in new and different ways? How will our support be contributory to that over time? Um, and so I think trying to draw the linkages out that localization is not an aspect of our programmatic approach, 
but is kind of a deep seated aspect of the thing that we are identifying as um, underpinning democratic renewal and resilience that we need to value um, less because of how we can adapt and adjust specific projects and more because that needs to be closer to our objectives and goals as a sector. David, uh, one last reflection from my end before you give any other reflections on your end uh, or, or question in terms of reflection uh, is we understand that USAID is doing some research on, on the effectiveness of democracy and mission driven, -driven bureaucracies. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on, the, res on the emergent research? Absolutely. Uh, and I should note, this is research that we're following. Uh, it's not necessarily one that we're driving, um, but there's a lot of uh, work uh, from scholars in the field. I'll particularly note Dan Honig, um, you know, examining differential performance of frontline officials and governments, uh, you know, and finding that a lot of that difference has to do with um, the ways in which frontline officials in particular, you know, local government officials, uh, the people who, as, as we've heard from our panelists, are solving uh, unanticipated uh, and difficult challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's kind of there, both room for maneuver and the extent to which um, the recruitment of those people, I'm, I'm very glad you asked the question about what got you into this. It's having people who are in it for the right reasons and who, uh, you know, uh, exude those values in what they're doing, that that actually makes major differences in how, you know, a health system, an education system, whatever big system performs. Um, and as we think about, again, linking with what Laura said in terms of understanding that, that democracy is expressed in how people feel included, feel that that their you know officials are responsive and accountable to them, in kind of everyday engagement. Uh, you know their formal voting or democracy as a sector, um, and so I think that's really interesting research looking at how do we think about what makes for government effectiveness and responsiveness as a question of cobbling together these um, different ways that bureaucracies function and that actors at different levels function, um, and not as, again, a single solution that you put in place and it's done, or as an accountability structure that is primarily uh, you know, top down or to us, but rather something that we can contribute to a more innovative and dynamic system by understanding how different actors play roles in it. And I think we have long valued a lot of our local partners um, as thought leaders and change makers that we can work with, um, but formally defined what they're doing as kind of executing mandates from above or executing on projects. Um, and I think for us to shift power to them and to really say we need to be accompanying them and supporting them over time, we have to also recognize what makes for more dynamic situations and leaders uh, and how can that be an end goal that we are moving towards. So I think there's interesting emerging research there on state society relationships and on um, how we can think about how our work is contributing and furthering those outcomes. David, really appreciate that. Uh, are there any other reflections you want us to provide? Do you want to provide to us before we turn to question and answers from the audience, and then final closing remarks from uh, Tanya? Um, so the only thing I will note, and I think it's something to build on, uh, you know, uh, a silver lining amidst the dreadful circumstances of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, there were some studies of. Uh, kind of in which spaces uh, there was effectiveness in support to uh, Ukraine um, quickly after the invasion, um, you know, things like, I, I, I'm heartened to hear some of the examples that uh, Natalia gave, um, and there was some indication that um, democratic governance programming was slightly more nimble or effective because we could define a wide array of specific tasks as fitting within the broad objectives of more responsive and accountable government or more engaged and participatory citizenry or whatever it was. Um, 
And I think it, we would do well as donors to learn that lesson, not only in such situations, but more broadly, that it was harder where we were saying we're going to distribute aid and support, but we need a very clear calculus of, you know, is it better to give, uh, you know, heaters or blankets or food and how much in each place that solving all of those problems, which is meant to make us more efficient, is actually making us um, less locally guided uh, and that uh, con by converse, when you set your objectives at the right level, you build the space for yourselves to be more responsive and adaptive because you can define different tasks and say this still furthers this outcome. Um, and I think that's an important lesson writ large for the international development community that I hope we can build on um, examining why we've been able to, uh, you know, to pivot well in situations where we've needed to and trying to uh, build that that way of working into more of what we're doing where it doesn't require such extreme circumstances for us to realize that we should be following what local leaders and change makers are identifying as, as what should be done. Now, I believe we've got a number of questions. I'm gonna try and uh, pose them to the best of my ability and maybe call on, on, on the people who've asked the questions to provide clarifications. Uh, but one question in the Q&A, and this is directed to USAID, so we can start with you, David, and then we can move to Laura uh, to, to answer. But it's what, what is the role of USAID in terms of system, system development and M&E systems to reduce financial corruption of the countries through USAID funding? Well, I mean, that certainly is a good and a very difficult question. I'm not sure that I can say that there is a single simple answer to it. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we have elevated, uh, you know, emphasis on combating corruption as a, as a major um, issue. Uh, and it's something that we are tackling across sectors, across programming. Um, I think devoting more attention to some of the transnational aspects of corruption that are behind it. Um, Laura noted the, the anti-corruption uh, policy that came out uh, last year. Um, it has some good specific illustrations of how programming should shift given this emphasis. Um, you know, I think uh, ironically, one of the learnings as well around um, combating corruption has been that uh, often what is effective in doing so is working more on the uh, you know, the relationships, the transparency and accountability, the connection between citizens and officials in a variety of ways. So I think there are targeted ways we can work on uh, making information more transparent. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to realize that um, we need to be contributing to local systems where actors are managing and reducing and, and limiting corruption themselves. Um, and so we have to find entry points where we can contribute to that rather than it being something where our project will do something and then that something will somehow have solved corruption for a country. Uh, that, that to me is kind of an older, more um, paternalistic model of, you know, we can fix it for you when the thing we're talking about fixing is a relationship among actors in the country, they're going to be best placed to fix it. And so figuring out how and is this more, uh, you know, technical fixes of making certain types of procurement or information transparent? Is it more social accountability, um, you know, will be very context driven. Um, I think there's a lot of learning around that, but I, I, I won't try and summarize what my colleagues who work on anti-corruption have learned. Um, there was an excellent anti-corruption learning and evidence week uh, just over a year ago as well all of which is recorded, and I would highly commend uh, a lot of excellent research gathered together there um, that might be of interest for anyone who wants to look further at some of those topics. Thank you. That, that was a very comprehensive answer. Uh, Laura, would you like to add anything to it? No, just to, just to I think, um, kind of emphasize again a couple of key points that I think that that David's made one is um that you know kind of what a system looks like is really dependent on where there are opportunities in the local system to to, to strengthen 
uh, to strengthen accountability and transparency. Um, I think one of the areas connecting through to the topic of, of, of this particular panel um, is, again, as David's highlighted, is the importance of really thinking about, you know, kind of the local knowledge that already exists and how we are building and strengthening that rather than developing those systems ourselves, really thinking about, you know, kind of the local actors, both within and beyond government with the, you know, with the, with the incentives to take this work forward and thinking about how we are supporting their efforts. Um, and then finally, I think the other thing that, you know, kind of David's pointed out that I think is going to be kind of a continue, an area where we want, really want to continue conversations with all of you um, is the thinking about how we are linking up local systems with transnational ones, right? I mean, this is an area that the, you know, the global strategy is really placed an emphasis where we are placing an emphasis through global programming and ensuring that, you know, kind of the work that we are doing globally to connect, you know, kind of local actors to regional and global networks is a really important piece of this puzzle in the area where I think there's a lot of uh, important conversations that we've yet to have. Great, thank you very much, Laura, for that one. Let me turn to the second question, and this is again directed to USAID. Uh, it, will USAID continue, continue to develop the private sector to enhance and engage it within the public sector development programs, specifically in terms of job creation and economic growth with the aim of redu reducing the burden on the public sector and increase income resources for Iraqis? So this is from Mohammed from Iraq. And I don't know if you want to take it, Laura, or if you want to take it, David. Okay, Laura will start. I will get us started. So um absolutely. I think, well, I, I would I would, you know, kind of slightly shift the way that it, that you know that that I would capture this. I mean, I think that you know, we are not developing the private sector, the private sector, you know, kind of is, is very well developed in the countries in which we are operating. And I think that the, the, the emphasis of this question, though, really goes to the point that we've been making around progress beyond programs, right? It is not that we would be developing, it's really kind of thinking about how we as an agency together with our implementing partners, both international and local, are engaging the private sector, thinking through the resources and incentives that they bring to the development challenges that we are taking on and thinking about how we are, you know, kind of making space for those partnerships and developing them as part of our programming. That is an area where, you know, we certainly have deep experience working in the economic growth sector. I think this is exactly where um, there, there are opportunities, you know, again, back to the, to the discussion at the top around, you know, kind of thinking about how, you know, we are contributing across our development portfolio to, you know, enhance democratic outcomes, right? effectiveness, sustainability of investments are areas where the private sector has a massive role to play. And thinking about how we are bringing together the private sector, citizens and communities, that is, you know, in, in doing that inclusively, inclusively, we are not only enhancing the sustainability of our economic growth interventions, but also in the, you know, in, in you know, kind of more closed contexts in which we're working, we could be, you know, kind of fostering newer accountability relationships and laying a, a groundwork for democratic development that is inclusive of private sector governance and communities over the long term. Great, thank thank you very much, Laura. Do you have <laughs> do you have anything to add to that, David? I think that's a great answer. So, I, I in the interest of getting to more, I, I'll probably let it stand for USAID because uh, I think there are some other questions, and as well, I wonder whether our panelists might have interesting um, perspectives on that question or others. All righty, yeah, okay. So maybe let me let me go revert to Natalia to see if there are any insights that you have on any of the questions in terms of engagement with the private sector, in terms of monitoring and evaluation. There's another related question, which was uh, which has been asked about the sustainability of monitoring and evaluation of projects at the municipality level, which I think might be quite relevant for you to answer. Uh, but any of the other questions uh, relating to the engagement with the private sector uh, and the work that you do in terms of engaging the private sector in addition to engaging your day-to-day -day citizens uh, would be very useful for, here to, for us to hear uh, your response. 
Так, дійсно, одним із yes, uh, this is one of the key areas uh, we are working in. We need to create jobs and restore businesses. Because in many cases, uh, businesses stayed in the occupied areas. Some businesses managed to relocate, but some didn't. They have all their equipment, uh, facilities there in the occupied areas. And now, as government, we are promoting and working together with our relocated businesses and other businesses who are recovering. Uh, we are supporting them in different ways, providing training uh, to raise additional funding to open their uh, facilities. We are supporting them by creating opportunities to take part in forums and exhibitions. For example, recently, uh, last week, uh, we had an exhibition, high-tech heat expo, uh, uh, involving our community members members, uh, businessmen who evacuated and were able to recover and restore their business with the help of uh, international partners, and they were exhibiting their results and uh, their products, and we as a government, we were showcasing our support and our interest in developing businesses and business structures that relocated from our community. As a government, we are taking relevant uh, decisions and mitigation policies to get businesses in, in, on board and uh, invite them to our community. That's through different uh, mitigation tools like uh, instruments to reduce the tax burden and to help them develop their businesses. Just to give you another example of priorities, we are looking into creating a public-private partnership to restore and develop businesses and create investment projects in the uh, in our community after it is liberated. Great, thank you very much, Natalia. Um, and now I'm going to turn to Mayor Mesa to, to see if you have any contributions around the area uh, of uh, private sector engagement, job creation and economic growth in your municipality. Uh, hello, Mayor Mesa. Did we lose you? Lara, do, can you hear me? Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, I can hear you, but apparently he's not with us anymore. Ah, I don't know. Just I see, see. On, the, on the participants. I don't know. See in the list of participants. Is he here with us? I think he may have had to leave. Uh... Okay. Yeah, he um, may have dropped. Uh, he may have had to leave for something. I do. I do apologize. Uh, well, okay. given that given that the mayor is not here, uh, I'm I'm going to then turn to Tanya to give us some reflections. And I think we've addressed all the questions in the chat. Are there any outstanding questions that we have? I think we've we we've kind of discussed that as well. Uh, so I'll turn to Tanya to just give us some uh, reflections, closing remarks, and I, I know especially around economic growth and job creation and those kinds of issues uh, would really appreciate it. And would you like to go and stand up, or would you like to sit so I can bring? Okay, I'll, I'll bring the I'll bring the computer. To you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone. I think this was a very inspiring discussion. You know, I was reflecting on sustainability and I know that there is a question about it, but what it is and how we define it and how it is 
different for different contexts uh, and how we can broaden that, right? And what we include in it, because, right, it should include resilience and ability to withstand shocks. And for Mayor Metzger, that is perhaps the fact that he's serving for seven years already, right? And has that continues to have trust of his community to elevate their problems and uh, and improve their livelihoods. And for, um, for Kremina as a as a um, as a community, it's their ability to sustain their ability to deliver citizen services, sustain their ability to innovate. Uh, they're currently almost a, a digital state, right? Because they have relocated, they continue to provide online education, online services uh, in a completely different form, and they're already making plans on what they will do you know day one of the return of the return to their physical infrastructure and to me that is also sustainability of investments that our local governance counterpart of uh you say investments of private sector investments into partnerships into into people um so i think sustainability is is not static as Sometimes we were looking at it in the past. Uh, it's not necessarily leaving physical infrastructure and tools and, and trained individual. It's leaving this ability to continue uh, deliver progress beyond programs. Um, and I think to me, the the panel is just emphasized how important to to look at it this way and how important it is to really bring local expertise uh, into any conversation, into any decision-making, because context is so different for everyone. Um, the, the needs and the goals are so different for everyone. And what has to be consistent is, right, the, the goal of improving livelihoods, the goal to provide the most timely assistance in the most needed spaces. Uh, so this this panel was a huge inspiration for me. Uh, I think we will continue to build um, our communities and our partnerships uh, wherever we work. Uh, we will continue to amplify the voices of our partners. And another thing that uh, I really wanted to, that, that really, um, you know, I noticed is how through working with a local government partner, we're really working with a huge network and huge number of voices from their communities because they, themselves work with citizens, students, youth, um, all sorts of populations and organizations. And by amplifying one voice, we are really hearing the voices of everyone um, they are talking to. So thank you, Peter. This was a very inspiring panel. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, all participants. And uh, there is a lot of great work ahead of us to, to continue to bring locally led development to the world. Great. Th th thank you very much. I'm going to go back here instead of going back and forth. <laughs> uh, so so j just to, just in closing to round out what what uh, Tania has said, uh, one thing that I picked up was that issue of trust, which she talked about. And that is so essential in building that trust relationship and brokering that trust relationship. When I was working in Vietnam, that was the first thing we needed to do. And it takes time to build trust. Uh, when you're coming to implement a project in the field, uh, you have to work with your government counterparts. You've got to work with your civil society counterparts. You've got to work with your local partners, uh, you know, and we are coming and we are saying, we want to co-design and we want to co-create with you. And I think that was one of the, the, the hallmarks of success of some of the projects that we've had uh, in the field is building up those trust relationships starting in the first few months of the project and then sustaining them through uh, throughout. I mean, uh, it, in, in the Vietnam context, it took a while, you know, uh, because we were going there and we were saying, okay, we've got this deliverable to do and we've got this deliverable to do uh, because we had a fixed price contract, which is not the best uh, kind of uh, contractual arrangement for a DG project or an economic growth project. Um, and our counterparts actually were like, and why do we need to worry about gender equality and social inclusion? You know, that's not one of on the top of our list of priorities. Um, and then we kind of had a conversation with them and we said, this is, you know, the reason why we'd like to do these things. And 
by the end of the project, when we talked about sustainability uh, and our partners were talking to us about sustainability, they said one of the biggest sustainable aspects of this project is gender equality and social inclusion, which we were really surprised about. But, but they really enjoyed it. They got to understand what we wanted to talk about, but we also heard what they wanted to talk about. Uh, and we found a, a middle point and we found a meeting ground. 